Good morning, all. It is a pleasure for me to be here. I'm honored to be attending and addressing such an esteemed body. I am grateful to King Mohammed VI and to the Minister of Justice, Ujar, to the public prosecutor, and especially to the President of the uh, Supreme Judicial Council, President Ferris, and to all others who are responsible for putting this program together. Again, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful to be here myself, but also with colleagues from the United States. Uh, we have representatives of the judiciary of the federal and the state government. We also have representatives from the administration side of governing or, or justice uh, from both the state and the federal. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that we have the National Center for State Court Vice President in charge of international operations, Jeff Apperson, with us today. And uh, I think many of you know that the National Center for State Courts uh, is a friend to Morocco, is very involved in Morocco in the past and will be in the future with programs that will benefit the judiciary. Uh, they do this not only in Morocco, they do it across the United States and around the world. They are a wonderful resource. I'm going to start by saying that in the United States, we, as many of you know, have three separate branches of government. They are separate, but in many ways they are interdependent. We have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, as many of you do. They are a check and balance on each other, and that is the theory of the separation of government, but it's also, as I said, the interdependence. Justice requires that judges must be free to interpret uh, and apply laws and to do so objectively and independently. At times, that may mean to challenge and overrule what the executive branch does, whether that's the executive branch in the state or the executive branch of the United States, which would be the president. The just, judges also must uh, uh, be mindful of the constitutionality of statutes that may be imposed by the legislature, and again, the legislature of the states or the legislature in Washington, which would be the Congress. It is not unusual uh, for judges to declare a statute unconstitutional or a portion of a statute unconstitutional. As I said, judges must uh, do their job objectively and independently, but that is more easily said than done because many pressures work upon our judiciary at times when there are decisions to be made. Now, criticism is a fact of life in the United States. Criticism of our government is something that we expect and something that we think is healthy for our government, all branches of our government. There are, judges are not immune to criticism either. Uh, judges most often are criticized for the opinions they render. And this is especially true in, in judgeships that are elected. We have both elected and appointed judges in the United States. In my state of Ohio, we stand for election from the municipal court, which is the lowest court, all the way up to the Supreme Court, the Chief Justice, which is what I am. Uh, we stand for election, and all of the voters in Ohio would vote for the Supreme Court. I'm proud to say that judges have made unpopular decisions in spite of this criticism. They have stood up to the criticism. They have done what is legally and morally correct, and they are able to do this in spite of the decision. And I will tell you also that there have been ramifications. Some judges have not been reelected because of the decisions that they have made. Nonetheless, they stand up more, more often than not and make the right decisions. What's especially true in the US now is the appropriate interplay and this is a, a very important topic in the U.S., between bail and fines and fees. Those are the mechanisms by which a judge will deal with a defendant, a criminal defendant, that comes before the court. Um, oftentimes, bail in the past has been used to detain an individual in jail uh, and to detain that individual unconstitutionally. 
and the fines and fees have been imposed without regard to an, a person's ability to pay. We in the United States are re rethinking that, relooking at that those practices because there has been uh, much attention drawn and uh, we have come to the conclusion uh, again through the National Center for State Courts uh, with their assistance and the uh, involvement of the Conference of Chief Justices and the Conference of State Court Administrators to do a, na a national uh, program to evaluate the use of fines, fees, and bail to come up with best practices and in the end to educate and help judges understand what the role is of both bail, fines, and fees. Uh, with training and education, judges understand that courts are not money sources for uh, the legislative and the executive branch. That in fact, those other two branches, it's just the opposite. Those other two branches must, uh, must fund the judiciary. That is their legal obligation. This is somewhat a deviation from past practices and theories. And judges, this emphasizes the fact that our judges are always learning, always rethinking as they should be. Judicial discussions, uh, decisions are made regarding life and liberty and assets. As judges, we must take our responsibilities seriously. And the reexamination of our practices for fines, fees, and bail, and other areas that, in which we render uh, decisions that affect the lives of people are, are something that is mandatory that we do and is, I think, a welcome opportunity. The most important perspective of a judge is to realize that we are all public servants. There is no reason for a judge to have a job except to make decisions and help people solve problems for themselves that they are not able to solve without the help of the judiciary. So we are public servants. We are answerable to the people on how we do our job, how we use our resources, and how we attend to our duties. And that is a, um, a, a newer way and oftentimes of thinking about the judiciary in the United States, and it's one that takes training and education and discussion. But we are doing that because, again, we owe that to the people that we serve. We are nothing. We are nothing if not public servants, uh, and it is our responsibility, by virtue of the oath of office that we take, to exercise uh, our duties and responsibilities with utmost in our mind that we are there for the public good and uh, to serve the public. With that, I thank you for the invitation once again, and I'm very, very honored to be here. Thank you.